I'd like to welcome everyone to this day of Zen that we are holding on Memorial Day weekend. At the same time, this weekend also is marked in the Christian community throughout the world as Ascension Thursday, which began two days ago, and it will uh, also be celebrated tomorrow, Ascension Sunday, the celebration of Christians is about the ascension, the full return of Jesus to the cosmic realm of heaven at the right hand of the Father. That's in Christian language. That marks the triumph over death, the triumph over Good Friday, the passion and death that he experienced, the passion and death that we humans are also going to be, uh, are also experiencing in this life, but which will, in Christian terms, conclude and culminate in that glorious realm of being one with all the universe and all the communion of saints. That's what the ascension means. But now we begin first with Memorial Weekend. This commemoration of the dead began with the commemoration of the war dead. We have had two major wars in the last century, and ever since, there have been many other wars throughout the world that have resulted in the killing of so many people, you could say needlessly. Why do people have to fight and kill one another? when we're all together on this earth, given life so that we could share the bounties of the earth. And yet we humans seem to be caught in something that makes us want to fight with one another. And that's what has happened. We have killed one another and millions and millions have died. And that's what we're commemorating. The, those who have died and we honor them, especially those who gave their lives in defense of some cause or in defense of others or as a gift to others. On the one hand, Memorial Day, commemorating the dead. On the other hand, ascension, the triumph over death. I'd like to take a look at these two sides from a Zen perspective. I'd like to begin with noting that our Zen practice is precisely an invitation to look straight into the eye of this so-called matter of life and death. We are reminded of that in session every night when we hear the cantor saying, this matter of life and death is of prime importance. Well, that seems to be a tautology. This matter of life and death is a matter of life and death. And so if we have not resolved that, then we will always continue to live life with a certain unease or a certain dislocation within us or a certain misplacement that leads us to do certain things that can be harmful to us and to others. Grabbing things, trying to be secure or trying to fight with others because we think we're better than them so that we can prove our own existence and so on. Because there's something in us that wants to live the fullness of life and yet we don't know how to. And the only way we can do so within the cultural and social upbringing we've had is to want to, ag uh, to aggrandize this little self of mine as opposed to others. And that's what leads to the kind of havoc that we're having in our world today. In addition to all that, we are now experiencing a very critical time in our world history with this plague that is called coronavirus. And people are dying by the scores and by the hundreds and by the thousands, day by day. As of today, the record is that there have been 3.38 3 million who have died of this coronavirus. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 3 point, uh, 338,000. I'm sorry for that. 338,000 throughout the world. And of these, the United States has had... 100,000 deaths. So with that in the horizon, what are we facing? 
we are all going to die, whether with the coronavirus, hopefully not, or at some point when our life has run its karmic end and we will simply exhaust this biological life and you, we will die. You will die. I will die. That is the matter that Zen invites us to take a straight look at. And in taking that straight look, to be able to find a way to live each moment of our lives in the fullness that it is meant to be lived. Precisely in looking at death. We have the ancient Western tradition of philosophy that goes back to Socrates, who said that philosophy is simply a matter of dying and being dead. What did he mean? He was giving a koan to the rest of the world. This activity, this intellectual pursuit that we call philosophy is simply a matter of dying and being dead. In fact, our Zen practice is precisely a matter of seeing through death and being dead to the little self and finding boundless life each moment. I'd like to approach this by offering a concrete uh, resource from Zen called a koan. One of the early koans that are given to those who have had a little glimpse of this world that is beyond space and time in having realized the true self that is beyond life and death, that is beyond birth and death, which we call can show or the realization of our true self is a koan by the Zen master who is named Tosotsu, pronounced in Japanese. And he presents what is called the three barriers to invite each practitioner to go through them so that they can be freed of this matter of life and death and live the fullness of life and death. I will not go through all the three, but just go to the second. If you have realized your true nature, you will free yourself from birth and death. Now, the question that Tosotsu throws at the participant, and that's what he throws to each and every one of us is, how will you free yourself from this cycle of birth and death when the light of your eyes is about to be snuffed out, when the light of your eyes is about to be put out, or in short, at that moment when you are about to die, how will you free yourself from the cycle of birth and death? When you are at that moment of death, or as you are at that moment of death, show me, the Zen master tells us, how will you free yourself from that cycle of life and death? This invitation of Tosotsu reminds me of what Ramana Maharshi, who was then called Venkata Ramanan, a 16-year-old boy, did. Ever since his childhood, he had been plagued with this morbid fear of dying. His relatives were dying. I don't recall all of the items in his biography, that, but he saw death from an early age, and so he had this morbid fear of himself dying, a reality that every one of us faces also. But he had it in a very sensitive way, and he really could not sleep even, and he kept on struggling with this question. And so he decided to look at it headlong and look at this matter of death itself. So what he did was take a place where he could just be himself, be by himself. He lay down and put himself in a, a situation where he imagined that he was now at the point of death. So he lay there, he closed his eyes, continued breathing, and imagined himself as dying, and then as dead. 
and then at that point in putting himself into that place where he imagined himself dead something clicked what clicked really transformed him so that from that moment on he woke up and from that moment on he had no longer any fear of death and he lived in a realm of full freedom and from that time on he lived this life truly having seen through this matter of life and death and so people were looking at him and saw a tremendous calm and peace and they revered him as a holy man and so that's how he lived the rest of his life he simply lived sim lived in a very very matter of fact way and in that total freedom he became a teacher to others ramana maharshi what happened in that moment when he imagined himself dying when he himself went through this portal of death and undertook it and then came out that's what we are all invited to do and zen practice if it is to mean anything for us is an invitation for us ourselves to go through those portals of death and emerge through it and be free so this tosotsu three barriers the second barrier invites us to put ourselves at the point of our death let's say we've caught the coronavirus and then we're afraid now what's going to happen and we take all medications and so on but in the end it amounts to nothing and it ends in our death and so many of our contemporaries have precisely undergone that imagine put yourself in that situation and put yourself at that moment when you are about to die breathing in and breathing out breathing in and breathing out and die who dies who dies as a clue to this i am reminded of another account of someone who went through this also in another another kind of way yesterday i was invited to offer some words of uh, pointers in zen to a group that was having a two day zoom zen in the philippines memorializing one of their teachers the successor of sister elaine mckinnis to the manila san un zen community named dr antonio perlas or they called him tony sensei and so i had the occasion to read through his short account of his own enlightenment experience and i'd like to read that Part, uh, some parts of it to you to give us a clue as to how to go through this portal of death and emerge and what happens and what will what awaits us as we emerge well let me read some of these excerpts of tony perlas tony perlas's account it was a session a zen retreat during the holy week of 1989 and he wrote about what he experienced he said during the free time before the zen talk of april 17 good friday at about 8 am i decided to wash my feet in preparation for listening to the talk so he must have been taking a walk around the grounds in breakfast and he must have soiled his feet in some mud somewhere i can imagine the zendo in the philippines i've been there and so he needed to he felt he needed to wash his feet so that he could feel refreshed in listening to the zen talk so he says or he writes as i washed my feet and concentrated on the movements involved in the washing i asked the question who is washing in half conscious and half aware manner the question he continues to write was taken from basho's sermon which sister elaine his teacher who founded the philippines endo asked me to read in that sermon basho this is a zen a japanese zen master in the middle ages or no basho is is maybe it's baso uh matsu suggested asking questions like who is walking who is hearing and so forth as a means of realizing your true self unconsciously reminded of this reading with that in mind as he washes his own feet he asked 
And he writes, I asked, who is washing? And in rapid, almost automatic manner, responses came almost as if I was not willing them, ending with, of course. And with this last statement, there was a sudden change in my perception, he writes. I was still aware of the notion of washing my feet, but the motion was now in the context of a motionless whole. At that instant, the oft-repeated term, and flesh melted away, became a reality. I experienced flesh melting away. A feeling of freedom enveloped me in that I was no longer forced to be trapped within the confines of my body. I was now aware of being in an infinite space of limitless freedom, a space of emptiness, which is also full. Truly, subject and object are gone. They're one. There is no separation. And for so many of us, and so many of the teachings that I had heard and read about became crystal clear. Of course, form is nothing but emptiness. And emptiness, nothing but form. This is still Tony Perla's writing. With this perception, there welled up in me, and with increasing pressure, a great sense of joy and happiness. My initial reaction to this experience was an observation intellectually made. So this is what all it means, it all means. This is what it all means, he realized, and which was then accompanied by a great sense of fullness and happiness. Continuing, as I walked from the bathroom to the sleeping quarters and through the hall, the joy within gathered in intensity so that I felt like shouting to relieve the tension inside and share this inner happiness. Not being able to do this, I had to content myself with having to experience this exhilarating feeling alone. A few moments passed and I happened to look out of the window. Outside, I saw the trees bursting out in smiles and laughter of happiness, sharing with me and the universe this momentous event. So that is Tony Perlas, who became a Zen teacher of and guide of the Philippine community for some years until he passed on in 2002. And I read that precisely as a hint for each and every one of us. We too can experience that moment of total liberation, but only if we are able to pass through this portal of this little I, me, mind trying to struggle with the question of who am I, who will die, what, am I, what if I die, what will be there on the other end, these are the questions that plague us as we are still on this side, still confined to this egoic self that we think is the center of the universe and we relate to the world and relate to others as a subject relating to objects out there. And that is the fundamental delusion that the Buddha himself saw through. And in seeing through that delusion, he was awakened and became free and became a person of wisdom and compassion. And that is precisely the same gateway that he invites us, us, invites us all to go through. So the simple task or the simple way the, of going through this is through that question that Basso suggested. Whenever we're doing something, when we notice we're doing something like walking, and I'd like to recommend this especially when we do the Zen walk in a very slow and deliberate way, just breathing in and breathing out. With each step, who's walking? Don't try to answer it with your imaginative mind, but just let the question ring through and let the question pierce through and permeate through our whole being. Who's walking? Who's taking this step? And then when we are simply sitting and breathing, breathing in and breathing out, who's breathing? Or when we ex are experiencing a pain in the knee, Who's feeling pain? Or as Tony Perlas noted in an activity of washing, who's washing? Or when we're brushing our teeth, who's brushing? Or when we're eating, who's eating? Just keep that question gently in the back of our mind. And in that 
way of living our life with that question, we are brought to the presence of, or rather to, to, the, to the awareness of the present moment. And in that awareness, who's this? The question might just trigger that opening that Tony Perlas talks about in his own life, which is available to each and every one of us. Who's this? And those who are blessed with seeing through that will experience truly for themselves and realize what all of these Zen teachings are all about. That there is a boundless reality that is right here in our midst in each and everything that we do and think and say that is waiting for us to discover so that we will be free from all of these egoic machinations, from all of these worries, from all of these anxieties of my little self and see through everything from that perspective of that boundless, timeless reality that we are. So those who glimpse at this, those who are able to glimpse this reality for the first time tend to be inebriated with it. They jump with joy and they cry out, hooray, I got it, I got it. And it can be a pitfall also. We can really just continue to conceptualize that and think that we're now in this ethereal, timeless, shapeless world and regard this concrete world of living and dying in a derogatory way. And that becomes another kind of dualistic mentality. So what Zen offers us is a way of returning back to earth and from that realization of emptiness, that boundless reality that we are, that you are, that I am. Remember that, that I am. Take that as another hint for your practice. I am, and let that I am lead you to no more I. It's just am, and then not even that, but that just shapeless, boundless, inexpressible reality of that is more intimate to us than we are to ourselves. And as we come home to that, we open our eyes and we realize it's the same old desk in front of me. It's the same old knee that's aching. It's the same old backyard. It's the same old front yard. It's the same old people in front of me, but seen in an entirely different light, seen with the eyes of love and compassion so that we cannot but love each and everything that we see and our heart then oozes with that love that we have discovered that is right there in that place beyond time and space, but it's more intimate to us than we are to ourselves. And so we can then live in a way that we will, fee, we will be like agents of that love with a capital L, seeking to embody that love in this world, in all the things that we think, say, and do, and in all the people that we meet, in the way we look at the earth, we look at the world, we look at situations around us. No longer from this egoic, anxious self perspective, but from the perspective of that boundless, timeless, and yet concretely grounded love in this frail body that I carry that will eventually end in death. But if we have really seen through Tosotsu's second barrier, we have gone through that portal of death, and we have died to that little self. And in having died to that little self, we are now free to be that so-called non-self that the Buddha talks about. But that non-self is not anything negative at all. It is precisely each and everything in this universe that is interconnected with everything else. And that's you. That's us. That's the world that Zen is inviting us to taste and see and embody in our own life every moment that we live on earth and beyond. So that's where the ascension points us to also. The ascension of Christ is simply a symbolic way of pointing out to the ultimate destiny of all beings. That place where we are now one in the community of saints rejoicing and celebrating our being together. So let us then take our practice as our gateway precisely to that world. And as we look at the world around us with all of its anxieties and all of its struggles, we now have a place, a vantage point by which we can see through them and be liberated from all of the little things that an egoic self 
concocts for us and see everything from that perspective of boundless compassion that seeks the wholeness and well-being of each and everything around us, beginning with ourselves. So let us then take this practice as our gateway accessible to anyone who would take this time to just be still and allow oneself to come home right here, right now, and pass through the portal of death and awaken to the realization of this boundless life here and now. This is what I'd like to offer for this Memorial Day as we commemorate the dead among us and the dying among us and knowing that we are also dying and in seeing through that we will know where is death? Where is the sting? Death, where is thy sting? Death, where is thy victory? It is simply the quiet joy of being here, connected with everyone this present moment, now seeking to give myself in my own little way as a gift so that that love might be more embodied in this world. 